Welcome back. This is Jess. Welcome to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. And I am here with one of my most formative comedians, entertainers from my childhood, from really my entire life. Guys, I'm here with Judy Gold. Oh, my God. I love you. I love you. You know why that means so much to me? You know, I had those people in my life. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's and when you get to meet them and when you get to and have a relationship with them and they're they're good. They're not like, you know, like I never wanted to meet Barbara Streisand because I don't want anything to change. You know what I mean? Totally. But the fact that. You know, I was doing, I was working my ass off and you were a little kid and you were like, oh, I could do that. You know, like I had the people in my life that were like, made me think I could do that. You know what I mean? I mean, who are the, who are the people like growing up? Like who were, who did you idolize? Like who were your people? Well, I loved Joan Rivers was like my comedy mother. Like uh, there was something about her, at, plus the fact that, you know, my parents respected her as well. She was highly educated, but she was a fuck, she was fearless and she was a big mouth. And she talked about, and I talk about this in my book, about her five decades in stand up. You really know where wom- women stood during each decade because of the material that she was doing. And, and she was just so fearless. Um, and, Everything was against her. It's, you know, I, when I was doing research for the book, I saw an interview that she did with, I think it was Alan King, and she's my age that I am now. Oh, wow. And it, it was like, you know, oh, no one wants an older woman. No one wants, you know, it's the same shit that I'm dealing with. But I I had these women like Toady Fields uh, who was this physical comic and you know and then her granddaughter is a spin teacher at my gym so it was like i fucking was so happy but you know, <laughs> there were like these sophie tucker mom's mabley like there were these phyllis diller there were funny women but they were really feminine too that was the thing but then when i was your like when i was in high school like elaine boozler carol leifer paula poundstone margaret smith like there were all these And there weren't that many women, but they were fucking funny, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, for for me, I remember watching your HBO half hour special. I remember I recorded it on VHS. Oh my God, I love you. High school. This was like 95, right? Yes, yep. I was like in 95, I must have been in like eighth grade or something, not even high school. I remember watching because they would repeat over and they would just repeat the same shit. I remember your half hour special and that same year, Janine Garofalo. We did it the same night. Really? Yeah. First of all, it's so funny because she came in and uh, it was and Mark Maron too. But uh, Janine and I did the same. And I remember she was so cool. You know, like you're in high school and. You know, I'm a fucking nerd. I'm like underneath all this. It's Uh like I'm a nerd. And she was just and I talked about this with her on my podcast, but she was so cool. Like they gave us a Swiss Army watch with, you know, it said, thanks, JHG from HBO. I was like, oh, my God, I got a gift. You know what I mean? And they like the swag bag. I was like, oh, my God, I got a swag bag. You know, like and she was like, I don't want this. I don't want I'm like, oh, my God, she is the cool. Like. I remember being obsessed with her outfit that, that whatever she wore that night she because she was right right on the heels of truth about cats and dogs so yeah, she was yeah. like really you know es- escalating in just actual like worldwide fame right and then there was you and your acts were so radically different like she you right. know you talked all about your personal life and hers was more you know the reality bites sort of vibe right the but cool. um yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember, first of all, I was, well, actually, before we get it, you you mentioned Joan Rivers, and I want to ask you, how do you think, well, Joan was famously friends with Donald Trump. Yes, yes. And so how do you think I know. she would feel, or how, how do you think this would have made it into so, her act? Such a great question, because... Well, first of all, there's, I think there's two parts of that question. Number one, uh, and this was the thing I was so like concerned about what, you know, I, first of all, I, th- I write in the book, it's, I feel like it was divine intervention that she died when she died. 
um, at, at, at because first of all, she was at the, she was never more relevant at eighty two. Like you know, she's she was pop culture. You know, she started the red card. She started all this shit. Like there'd be no Bravo. There'd be no sort of any of these shows. It, it was all right. Anyway, you know, I listened to some interviews and she's like, "Oh, he should, he's great. He's really smart. He should be president." And I, I called her niece. Her niece is the greatest. And I said, do you, what do you think she would be thinking? And she said, the children in cages would have said her, that would have been it for her. Um, I mean, obviously she was Republican leaning and socially liberal and very pro Israel, but I think she would have had to have dealt. I mean, come on. I think about her all the time about the shit that she could have said about him. Of course he would attack her and be like, oh, she'd be nothing if I didn't, you know. But I really think I would love to hear her take on it. I know. It, it, remi- it reminds, like, when I think of Joan Rivers and 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 Trump, I it makes me think of Howard Stern and Trump because yeah. they, too, were famously friends. They were, like, social friends in New York City and the Hamptons. And yet, Howard was very publicly campaigning for Hillary and now he's like he openly every day trashes Trump like right. he doesn't and rightly so rightly so it's like you know yeah they were friends because they were both entertainers you know like he yeah. was an entertainer also you know Howard Stern also famously says that uh Trump was his best guest because he has no edit button right so it's like yeah, they were on the same playing field, that level playing field then, you know? So tell me about, so like, obviously you came up with Janine Garofalo. Like, who were your friends, like, in the day? And we're- So funny. My son just said, asked me who my friends were. Oh my God. Um, so who did I come up with? Okay, these are the people I came up with. John Stewart, Ray Romano, Wanda, Joy Behar and Susie Essman were ahead of me and sort of- I really looked up to them. Uh, Same with Mario Cantone. He was a little ahead of me. Um, Who else? I'm trying to think. um, Did you come up with Rosie or was she already, she'd already made it? She had already been, people already knew who she was. Um, And she, you know, I knew her in the mid 80s. I think she was dating a friend of mine. I don't know, she was friends with a friend of mine who was also a comic. And... I just knew her. And then I remember she was on the road and she got this, they, they were auditioning for a host for VH1 and she was literally at a gig and just left the gig to go audition. <laughs> but she was really, yeah, she was ahead of me, but really good for that show. She gave a lot of people time on that show to, to validate them and get them into clubs and, you know, VH1 stand-up spotlight. Um I'm trying to think. Well, was I like mean, like I'm thinking of like Ellen DeGeneres when she was doing stand up. Did you know her when she was just on the road? No. Well, I was in New York. She was in L.A. I knew who she was, but I was yeah. She was already her and Paula. And, you know, you look at those early HBO specials. They were all. I mean, I was I hit in the ninety in the mid nineties. You know, and they had already been. You know, because Ellen already had a show by then. Right. Um, and, you know, Roseanne, she was she was uh, before me. But, you know, it was like this early 90s, late 80s, when it, when it was a boom. And then all these comics were getting development deals because mm-hmm. of Roseanne. Because yeah. they saw her act and they created this, this sitcom around her. And it was like, I felt like so many comics were doing stand-up as a stepping stone to get that. And they would adjust their act. They would they would make their act about like, hey, you know what? My uh, my mother lives across the street and I blah, blah, blah. And I have a crazy, you know, nanny for my, you know. And they would literally do that so that people would give them. And I think I'm the only person who didn't get a development deal. Like everyone was getting or a holding deal or a holding deal. So why, do you, like now that you're able to like, look back on it, do you have a sense of why that was? You know, I feel like, I think it's half Jew, half gay. 
And I feel like, you know, I'm a big, pr I'm one of those people, you know, it's always like hype. I'm like, I'm me. I'm not a type. I'm, you know what I mean? They always try to pigeonhole you. Um, I'm big, like physically big. I'm loud. I'm very opinionated. And I, I don't know. I think maybe people were scared off by that or, you know, it's one thing to be tiny like Joan and get out there and have a big mouth. It's, it's another thing to be a big person. You know, if I was like, hi, I'm, you know, I think maybe things would have been different, but that's not who I am. And, and I was constantly being told too Jewish, too Jewish, too Jewish. And really? finally, finally, I was like, fuck you. I had managers told I had, and I have fucking eight by tens of with straight blonde hair. I look like a fucking newscaster. Um, you know, so, they, they, so who made you like dye your hair blonde and straighten it? Well, I had representation. I had ma a manager said, you know, you should dye your hair blonde. But then I once met Kevin Acoin at a TV taping, you know, the the makeup, the greatest guy. He's like, you would look great with blonde hair. So I did it. I did it when he told me. But then they were like, straighten it. And if you look at old stuff, like I was hosting like Talk Soup or... Um, other, you know, when Anderson had a had a daytime show and I was co-hosting, you know, like you can see it's this blondish straight hair. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I did my one person show, 25 Questions for a Jewish Mother, where I was like, yeah, fuck you. Like my hair's curly. This is who I am. Don't fuck. You know, it's it's so it's, it's a whole fun. thing. It's a whole thing with um, Jewish women with curly hair. Like I obviously you can see I have I have very wavy curly hair yeah. and everyone I know people in my family, like everyone I know just tries to like straighten their natural. Curls. Right. And I never I never like one time I think my cousin like blew out my hair and I was like, I don't look my, like myself. Right. Like I'm supposed to look this way. And right. I guess, listen, every person is different. Every person you know some people look better with straight hair but yeah yeah there is this pressure to like straighten the hair it's weird right and I would have I would go on auditions and my and it would be I'd get an audition and then my agent will also say straight hair you're going in this straighten your hair and I was like what the fuck is going on yeah. straight hair is so fucking boring yeah. you know yeah I agree I agree so I was obsessed with the Rosie O'Donnell show. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was another avenue that I had into your world. Mm -hmm. So how did you get the gig as a writer? So Henry, uh, so I was living in LA and my ex, Sharon, got pregnant. And she said, okay, we got to decide, are we going to live in LA or are we going to live in New York? And I was really working. I was just done All American Girl, then um, Margaret Cho's sitcom, and then I got another sitcom for the UPN right after. Like, I left that show having another job, which is quite unusual. Plus, I was doing guest spots, and I did my HBO special. I, like, things were really happening. And she goes, okay, you got to pick, because we have to live in one place. And I was like... I don't want to bring, you know, like I'm a New Yorker. You know what I mean? I just didn't, I always wanted to bring my kids up in New York. So I said, New York, oh, let's move back to New York, which, you know, my agent and manager were like, oh my God, you're such an asshole. And so, uh, <laughs> and we should say like, you grew up in Jersey, right? Right. And my mother was from Manhattan, you know? So, and like, where do you go to high school? Clark, New Jersey, Arthur L. Johnson Regional. Okay. Suburban New. Are you from Jersey? No, I'm from Long Island. Oh, all right. Same, same. Say it's the same. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I grew up like 27 miles from New York, but my mother was from here, and I had relatives in the city. So it wasn't like you know. The, you, there's so many people who would like live 25 miles outside of New York. Like I'm never going there. You know, I would never go to the city. It's there's so fucking people are. Ugh. Anyway, so I you know my mother always said it would have been so much easier to bring her kids up in New York. And I always was like, I just, I wanted my kids to have that experience. I, and the only reason I was in LA was for work. It wasn't like, oh, I love California and I love, you know, there were great things about it, but it wasn't, I'm, I wanted to go out and do sets every night, not drive in a fucking car. And so anyway, we moved back to New York and Henry was born and uh, Rosie was like, come out, you know, come over. So I brought Henry over. She's like, oh my God, he's so cute. She said, listen, 
why don't you send in a writing sample so you don't have to go on the road? You'll you'll do one cycle, one 13 weeks. I'm like, oh my God, that's a great idea. So, so was the show in. already on the air? It had just started. It had just started that. He was born September 24th. I think it started that September, like wow. week. It was on. And so I sent in a writing sample. And the next morning, I she was doing a couple of my jokes and I was like, yeah, I got this. And so they called me and, and hired me and I ended up staying for two seasons because I'd go to the writers meetings in the morning. You know, we had to have jokes written by like 930 in the morning. It was so awful. We had to be there by seven and you're writing jo- I'm like not my fucking clock getting up that early, you know? And so when I would go into these writers and I would look in like USA Today and all these ridiculous, you know, newspapers and magazines for ideas for jokes. And I started finding these weird people and I kept saying, oh my God, there's a kid who's obsessed with vacuum cleaners, knows everything about vacuum cleaners. She's like, get him, get him, get him. And I ended up being the human interest producer for two years. And I got all the kids on the show and all the real people. And I think it suited me because I knew her sense of humor. I knew how she how she could shine with regular people. And so, yeah, I spent so much time in schools in New York City, public schools, trying to find kids. And it was it was a really great experience. What's interesting is, so it, a couple of things. So Rosie quit after six years. Right. Ellen has gone up. I mean, how long has her talk show been on? A while, like 14, isn't Something, it a long time? Like 14, 15 years. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I mean, granted, they were in different places in their lives. You know, Ellen was more established and ready to, quote unquote, retire. Like she had said, this will be the last job she ever has when she took the talk show. But it is interesting that that Ellen has been able to kind of like keep the train going. I also feel like, you know, Ellen doesn't have any kids, you know, Mm -hmm. so her life is different. She just has Portia and a lot of money. It is, is the same staff. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, like Andy Lassner was at Rosie. There's a lot of people who went over there from Rosie. I mean, and a lot of people stayed in New York and work on like Wendy or um, Dr. Oz, you know. You know, you have to think about Ellen's life versus, I mean, Ellen not only has that show, but it's like she's, you know, the voice of all these like spectra, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. American Express, like all, it's like how much fucking money do you need? But I mean, were you surprised when those stories started to come out? Like the, about the, Ellen? Yeah. The stories of her, her staff saying that she was just like a monster to them. Like, what did you know? Ma- I was not surprised to hear that. Um, you know, there's where there's smoke, there's fire, but it's also, I, you know, I've never worked with her. I did a couple of stand-up things with her, and she was very nice. But I, yes, of course, I've heard the thing. Like, we all knew Bill, not that they're similar, but we all knew Bill Cosby before it came out, you know. But there's also this unfair perception, like, especially with Rosie, oh, she's a bitch, she's a bitch. She's had a hit show, and she knew what she was. You know, like, it's like women are bitches. You know what I mean? Uh, and guys are like, wow, he really knows what he wants. That's great. You know, it's just such a double standard. But yeah, I'd heard about for a while. So the show was on for six years. And I remember it was maybe around like year five or so that she changed. Like the show yeah. changed and she changed. Yeah. I think for two reasons. Number one, she had just adopted no she had already had parker but i think maybe around the time that kelly carpenter her partner yeah. was their relationship was becoming less and less hidden or less less and less overt right hidden. right right and also i remember columbine happened columbine was what did it and yeah. she just she went into like this big depression and like she couldn't go on the air it was a whole I remember Drama. I wasn't there during that, but I do know that Columbine really had a profound effect on her and she changed. Yeah. Like we all knew she was gay, of course. Um, and I was already out and you know, we, I, we used to joke, you know, John McDaniel, like in the morning when we would do rehearsal, I, I we used to say to each other all the time, like if, 
if the world, if like the middle America knew how gay this show is, like everyone was gay or gay friendly or gay, gay, gay. It was so gay. It was like a bunch of gay people playing in the room. Like, here's a great show, you know? Um, and I, I think, I don't think that telepictures really cared if she came out. I think she, ha she came out when she was ready to come out. Um, so I don't know how much her relationship with Kelly, I don't know. I, you know, everyone, there's, there's so many different reasons for people coming out, you know, when they come out and, um, but yeah, she had Chelsea, uh, she had Parker, they had, then they, you know, then Kelly had a baby and Blake and they got, you know, so it's so amazing when you think about the gay rights movement and that, you know, the AIDS crisis really was the catalyst for change because people were dying and then their partners of 30 years are being shunned by the family who never talked to them because they were gay. And then they come in at the end or like, this is mine, get away. You know, people weren't going to each other's funerals you know, their, their partner's funerals, people, you know, you couldn't hide, you couldn't be in the closet anymore. It was, you know, and I just think, I don't know. I am a firm believer in coming out of the closet. And were you, know were you funny. always out on stage? No, I was, it, I wasn't in, I just, well, I was, I just never talked about it. Like what was but your, early, you, like the early, I remember what I remember from that special was I mean obviously all the stuff about your mom but pre the special like what what did you talk about on stage I talked a lot about my mother I talked about I mean so much of it was my relationship with my mother you know and then um then when I moved to LA I had these lesbo roommates and I would talk about my lesbo roommates and you know I and I would do gay things, but I didn't have any material. First of all, I didn't want to be pigeonholed as like, she's a lesbian comedian. I was just a comedian who happened to be a lesbian. And I didn't have anything funny about my relationship. It was like a boring lesbo relationship. Um, and it wasn't until Henry was born. And I was like, I had all this material. And I was like, every comic talks about their family. I'm talking about my family. And also... Like, what kind of message is that to send your kid like, oh, we don't talk about this. You know, this is, a, you know, and I was proud of my family and it got to the point where, so I kind of came out as a gay parent. Most people come out as gay. I came out as a gay parent and people would watch my act. And after a couple of minutes, they'd be like, oh, this is the same shit we go through, you know, with an extra twist. And and I think I had so many people come up to me after shows. I see why you want to get married. I see why, you know, because you see the world. Once you have a kid, you see the world through their eyes. Like when they're like, why can't you get married? It's like, right. Why can't we? How? Tell me how it, you know, I remember Eileen Shaken, who created the L word. Yeah. She, I remember the, the little germ pre L word was that she wrote an article called the lesbian baby boom. I think in like the mid nineties and tell me, I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Like how did you and Sharon like decide to have a, ha, to have kids? Like it, I mean, yes, there obviously was this baby boom going on within the, the female community, the female gay community, but how, like, what was your guys process? It was all, we were together. Uh, we were all together about 19 and a half, 20 years, but you know, we were together and we always thought we were going to have kids. I mean, it was, it's like every fucking relationship, you know, when you meet someone and you get married and you're like, we're going to have kids. It was like, we're going to have kids and we're, this is the way we're going to do it. And, you know, I wasn't the first, but I was one of the first to talk about it, you know, and you know, it's, it's so interesting. You look now, you look at Anderson Cooper and Andy Cohen and theirs is even more complicated. You know, we went to a sperm bank and bought sperm, which was around forever because there were so many infertile couples. So it's like you're, it's a natural course in your relationship. You're with someone, either you want kids or you don't want kids. And we wanted kids and we did what we had to do. I, I think it was just a natural thing. And how, what, like being a gay parent in the 90s like how was that like i mean with like i'm you know, thinking about like teachers other parents like 
was it hard? Was it easy? Like, what was it like? Well, for a lot for us, for a lot of people, we were there first, you know, like at daycare, they went to a daycare uh, preschool, and we were the first same sex parents there. Um, we were so normal, like, I don't I hate the word normal, natural, You're like, it was like, not an issue. And if you make it an issue, it's an issue. If you don't make it an issue, it's not an issue. Uh, and it's their problem. Like, that's what I try to tell people all the time. Like, all this shit and this pushback that people give you, it's about them. It has nothing to do with you. But it was interesting because since it, it was the mid-90s, you know, they would go, go to school and eventually, you know, kindergarten. And it was every form, mother and father, mother and father. So I very i was an advocate for changing all the school forms uh christine quinn i i had um contacted her and she was great and changed all this you know the uh school forms to parent guardian and also and it wasn't because i'm i'm gay after 9 11 so many kids didn't have one of their parents or both of their parents and so many kids had were living with their grandpa, you know, who's to define a family, pa you know, mm -hmm. mother, father. And my kids would be like, what am I supposed to write? And I'm like, don't worry, I'll, ta I'll handle it. So it was that I ended up also a few years ago, writing an article for Huffington Post about when Ben, our younger son went to get his tonsils out. And they kept saying, one of the nurses said, who's the real mother? in front of him and I said, first of all, we're both his real mother. Don't ever ask that question and especially in front of a child. And then I said, if you're asking who the biological mother is, you know, I'll tell you that. But, you know, I I couldn't believe the hospital form. So he's gonna be 19. So this is about six or seven years ago. The hospital forms were still mother, father. And then this is what got, this is, he would, I brought him home. First of all, Sharon and I were together for his surgery and they let, they're like only one person can go in. And I saw this straight married couple and they both went in. And I said, why, why are they allowed to go in? They're married. They're the, both the parents. I said, we're both the parents too. You know, and it was this constant, always always corrected people do you know what i mean there's this all uh, this need to you can't let it go like sometimes you know it's like you have a cab driver's like oh how tall is the father and he doesn't have like sometimes you're like i don't feel like doing this but you have to because it lets them know that we're you know in the world so i wrote this article and it's used now to do sensitivity training, but he was mm. home. I went to get him ice cream. He's home alone in the apartment and the hospital calls and says, is your mother or father there? I'm like, I just fucking changed all the forms I, in fucking Sharpies, you know, but it's interesting. There's a whole other layer to being a gay parent. It's that your kids also have to come out yes. every day, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, they go they go on with you you give birth you and then they go on with their life and they everyone assumes they have a mother and father you know especially ben who's playing you know division one basketball you know yeah but they don't and the fact that they're they don't care that that's their family it's just it's you see how the world could change for people like one of your most like iconic uh bits is you know and it was name of the year album you know judith's Judith's roommate, roommate had Judith, a baby. Judith's roommate yeah. had a baby. Now, for for listeners who like aren't you know keyed into this, can you like would you please just kind of like so people can really kind of get your your vibe in the, so, the acids? Yeah. Okay. So when Henry was born in '96, my mother would and you know it's interesting you bring up Rosie a lot. My mother didn't tell any of her friends, and then when Madonna gave birth to Lourdes she brought you know there was all it was in the paper oh my god she's you know because rosie and madonna were really good friends she's gonna bring lourdes on the show she's gonna bring lourdes on she had no intention to bring lourdes on the I show i remember this yeah and so the executive producer said you know because they were the same age they were just born you know they have similar birthdays and so he said can we use henry as like a prop baby <laughs> and I talked to Sharon and she was like, sure. And Sharon <laughs> came that morning 
And I mean, you cannot imagine the paparazzi. They, you know, this is before you had to show your fucking ID at the people were just running into 30 Rock and trying to get in the elevator. It was fucking ridiculous. And and so Madonna comes out with this baby and Rosie's like, oh, the you know, baby's so cute. But that's not your baby. And she's like, so Madonna is literally holding an infant and it is your son. Right. And backstage, you know, we were all hanging out and I'm like, oh, he loves singing. You know, because I used to sing to him all the time. And then she starts singing and he starts crying. So I was like, great. Um, Wait, Madonna, and- Madonna started singing? <laughs> yeah, Madonna was like, oh, whatever. You know, rock oh, my, my baby. God. <laughs> um, anyway, she brings him out. And then they do this whole thing. And everyone's like, oh, my God, there's Lourdes. And she's like, but that that's not your, you know. And, and it was a he. And they were calling it a she. Anyway, calling the baby a she. And then she says, that's our, that's actually you know, Judy Gold's baby, our, one of our writers. So, so I went out and got the baby. And then all my mother's friends, I didn't know. what uh, Judith had a baby? How did that happen? Blah, blah, blah. So anyway, my mother would tell them Judith's roommate had a baby and then Judith adopted it. And like this was, and I was like, Ma, who the fuck? Like, I had a roommate, like we're paying rent. And I'm like, oh, I should probably pay for half of that kid. It was the most ridiculous, like it was so, and I used to do this bit. Judith's roommate, she was walking down the street. Uh, There happened to be a hypodermic needle flying around. uh, It landed in a vagina. It happened to have sperm in it. She she had a baby. (laughs) And because it was so beyond a ridiculous state, like we're roommate. And, and the fact that my mother had friends who had gay kids and she's like, I'm not bringing it up. You know, if, if she doesn't want to bring it up, I'm not bringing it up. Let her bring it up. I'm like, Mom, you can talk to Doris. Uh, she has never told me her son is gay. And how do you know? I'm like, cause I see him at the gym and he's gay. You know, and it was just this, you know, she loved Henry and she loved, you know, she wasn't like, you know, she believed in equality, but she used to always say stuff like, why do you have to talk about it all the time? And I'm like, because I have to. Like, that is uh, that is who I am. You know, I don't care what other people think, you know? It is, it is a, I think, like a Jewish mother. Like, I think about, like, Seinfeld's mother and and there was some there's some other comedian who always used to speak about their mother like a jewish comedian and right. and too like in my own life i think of my mom and, and and my grandmother when she was alive what is it about jewish mothers and grandmothers that everything is a secret everything is oh a deep my God. dark fucking secret it uh, you know uh, we talk about this in my family all the time that it's this you know i think I think a lot of this is this idea, you know, that we have been kicked out of every country. I mean, it comes from generations back, like, don't give them any more reason to hate us, you know? And I think it comes from that. Um, I also think that, you know, to put on a happy face and, you know, because it's it gives I think when people know more about you, it gives them power. They don't want to give. I don't know. But it's this. It, everything's a secret. I would find out people were sick or dead. I'm like, why didn't I, oh, it, 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 you don't need to know. I want to know. You know, you're not protecting me. Um, but I, I really believe that generations of mothers who, you know, who watch their kids like you know leave and never come back and you know you gotta realize like it it definitely seeps down from generation to generation in your act you you talk about how eventually you and the mother of your your two kids your Sharon, yeah. yeah your your longtime partner you so eventually you guys broke up why did you oh she what i i'm remembering now why you broke up because you we talk were playing about playing yahtzee and she cheated <laughs> that's what i used to say <laughs> I didn't want to bring it up, but now, yes, yeah. I'm remembering. Yeah. So you guys broke She hates up. when I say it. I'm like, oh, God, get over it. I mean, it's not like I was perfect in the relationship, but, you know, we were like Bill and Hillary. You know, we both worked our asses off and, you know, we the passion had, you know, drifted, but we loved being parents together. Yeah. In your act, you talk about how after you guys broke up, you remained in the same apartment building. Right. How did that work? Well, I, I was really devastated because 
you know, I was never going to leave my kids. And I didn't have kids so I could see them half the time. I was so attached to them. And I sort of, it's interesting because I was initially like, oh, I don't know if I want to have a kid. And then I became the like mommy. I loved it. I loved it so much. So once we broke up, she did have another apartment for a little bit. And then I got her an apartment in the building. And I was like, this is great. Then I get to see them every day, even when they're sleeping at her place. So we did that for a while. And it's so funny you bring that up because that was one of my pitches of my sitcom. You know, like I'm going in to pitch a sitcom about this lesbian couple that broke up. They live in the same building, my mother, blah, blah, blah. But no one would take it. But it was like the perfect recipe. And so, yeah, so she lived in the same building. And when I met Elisa, my partner now of 13 years, she Sharon was living in the building. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she stayed with me, (laughs) Sharon living in the building is so fucking hilarious. Now Sharon lives in a penthouse apartment, but um, good for her. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I just, I was just so attached to them. And I was, you know, because I worked at night, I was used to being home with them after school and bringing them to school. And she was an executive. It was, yeah, I would do anything for them. Yeah. Now, so you bring up Elisa. Now this is another fucking wild story because I remember, I mean, mean, we're going to have to like explain to people how, how, how you met and the story of how you met Elisa. But I remember when this new, this Time Out New York magazine came out and I saw your ad. No way. I, Judy, I'm telling you, I followed your entire career. I know. Oh my God, Jess, I love you. I'm telling you. I remember, because I used to subscribe to Time Out New York. I'm a New Yorker, Long Island's a whole thing. And... I remember thinking it was hilarious that that you had an ad in there and then tell everyone how you All met right, Elisa. So they did. So Time Out New York did this Valentine's Day issue and they had the 20 most eligible singles in New York and the uh, LGBT editor picked me to be her most eligible single. So so we went and I got my photo taken and then I had to write a little description. You know, like an ad, like you would write it. So I, I wrote something like, you know, I'm looking for someone to do my kid. And I did this like not thinking I would ever meet anyone. It was like a, it was like a bit. It was a joke. Right. So it was like, I'm looking for someone to do my kid's laundry while we snuggle under my troll pattern flannel comforter while we drink a bottle of red wine as I scream on the phone to my mother about her home health aid, like something ridiculous. And then I wrote seriously funny, Jewish and smart, whatever. I was just, and I would get, so they gave me a Gmail account just for this thing where people would write to me and they would write, I'd have like, let, you know, email conversations. I'm like, oh, this person's interesting. And then I'd say, can you send a photo? And then, you know, I'd be like, okay, take care. Um, but <laughs> some, I had some people send photos literally of you know when you know when you walk in a in a office building in new york and they take your photo for the security thing like that like people i was like i can't take this like a driver's license photo and then some people would write and didn't get it like oh i'm very good at laundry blow and i'm like no (laughs) no so i kind of gave up and then a couple weeks go by and i check it and there's this email from elisa and she had seen my show she didn't tell me that but she said you know i'm happy to do your kids laundry if you don't mind a few pair of pink tie-dye undies in there and you know uh, i i know who you are and i'm single now you know and she so said she something was, so about, she was a fan of yours yes and she said something about um you know she knows what i look like so it's only fair that I know what she looks like, if I can get my, you know, six-year-old nephew to show me how to upload a photo. Like, she was just funny and charming, you know. And then she sends me a photo of her holding her cousin's newborn baby. Like, so strategic. And I'm looking at the photo going, does she have all her fingers? Is, you know, I really was looking because it was, and then, we met one at Joe Allen one night after I was doing 25 questions next door at the uh, St. Luke's theater. And then it was freezing. It was February. And I wore my mother's mink. coat. 
she had given me her mink coat because after my father died, she's like, I have no way. I, 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 I'm never going to wear this again. Anyway, and I walk. She's waiting for me at the bar. I was a little late at Joe Allen. And I walk in. And you know what, Joe Allen, especially in the winter, they have like this plastic up so that when the door opens. Yeah, yeah. So it was like plastic. The door opens and this gigantic woman in a fucking fur coat walks in. And Elisa was like, oh, my God. Anyway, we just hit it off. And she was wearing a skirt. She looks so adorable. And that was it. And I just ran after her. I love it. And she's uh, she's a therapist or is she right. still is she still a therapist? No, she qu- she stopped to run her family's real estate business. So oh. now she was much nicer when she was a therapist. <laughs> you know, the Michigas working with your family like you can't get away from all the Michigan been trying to get away with from, yeah, yeah. you know, your entire adult life, you know? You know, the New York Times has called you the most underappreciated comedian in New York. Right. And I think about, you know, like you're talking about like your act back in the day and like right n- now, like they write about how Amy Schumer is revolutionary because she did her Netflix special when she was pregnant. And I remember you used to, like you used to go on stage. All pregnant all the time. And I used to... T- I used to fake I was giving, you know, I was having a uh, contraction. I used to pour water on the stage and be like, oh, my God, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's just so funny that, you know, everything's new when it's been. I know, It's really frustrating. I mean, I love Amy. I love her. Yeah. And I love that she's such a feminist. And I loved, you know, her show on Comedy Central. But it is so dismissive of, you know, she's not like that. The media is like that. You know what I mean? Of of what came before you and who set that stage. And, you know, I think of Robin Tyler, who was, she's in her late 70s probably, but she, or maybe she's eight, I don't know. But she was an out gay comic, like, uh, so long before anyone and was out there in the 70s, you know, talking about being a lesbian and wanting to get married. And, you know, it's just, why do we forget that our history? And I think that's why we end up in the fucking situation we're in now in America. How how have you been doing? I mean, you, listen, you you're used to performing nearly every night, like either at the Comedy Cellar. Oh my god, I want to kill myself. West Side Comedy Club. I know. So tell me, how has it been as as a comic? Like, what have you been doing for right. the past three four months? Um, well, thank God my book is coming out because that has given me a lot of shit to do. But I have to tell you, it's like 839 hits and I'm like a ball of energy. Like, um, I've done some Zoom shows. It's really, I mean, it's not as gratifying. I get the, I get the high. I mean, I ha- I could go upstairs and, you know, I have a fake brick wall background. I have a mic. I, you know, it, but it's just not the same. Um, I did perform at a drive-in theater, movie theater in Queens. We're on the back of a flatbed truck. <laughs> They're like laughing by flashing their lights. Oh my I'm, god! I'm like doing stupid fucking like, come on, Audi, you're a fucking asshole. You know, it was just so stupid. Um, but if you know, it felt good, and I feel like. I'm g- I'm gonna be I'm in Provincetown now and I'm gonna be doing two shows a week here. So yeah, I saw outside. that. You're, I saw you're gonna be doing outside at the Crown and Anchor. Yeah, so awesome. me and Marla Jean Merman and I are gonna do a Wednesday show and then I'm gonna do Mondays by myself. So that should help feed the. But you know, there's one thing I've learned. I don't want to travel anymore. Like that, I have never. This was such a weird time because. You, you talk about how I, like, I still, I'm one of these comics that still went out five nights a week. Like, I eat dinner, whatever, and I deal with the kids, and then I'd be like, all right, bye, I'm going to do a set, I'll see you before you go to sleep, whatever. And now they're out of the house, thank God. But, you know, I I still would pinch myself. I'm 57 years old, and I'm still getting on the subway at 9 o'clock to go do a set, and I fucking love it! You know, I love being a stand-up. So, but... All of a sudden in March, everything stops and we have dinner and I'm like, oh, oh, we can, we can binge watch something. Oh, like it was so like, oh, this is how regular people live. And I kind of like not having anything to do. I, will I still do, you know, I'm still going to work. I'm not going to go out 8,000 times a week and do it. I don't, I feel like I, 
who knows what'll happen when it, you know, but I do get really crazy at like nine o'clock at night mm -hmm. <laughs> for some um, reason. And I miss the theater. The theater. So, okay. So speaking of that, is it, you were cast in a Broadway show right before the pandemic? Right. So they were doing uh, last summer at Bluefish Cove was coming to Broadway. It's a lesbian play. Um, it was being produced by Ellen and Portia and uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane. Oh, my God. Uh, and, uh, Harriet Levy and all that. You know, it's it's a story of, you know, lesbians in the 70s directed by Cynthia Nixon. And I had done some reading. Whoa, this is this is major. Yeah. And I got this call. That, they, you know, and I was like, oh, my God, because bucket list. I mean, I had done off Broadway and I did Shakespeare in the Park, but bucket fucking list. And I said to my agent and manager when they called to tell me, I said, oh, well, the theater will probably, you know, burn down the first night of previews, like, because that's my luck. You know, because we were joking, because I always, you know, it's just like I'm fucking Larry David times a thousand million. And so then Elisa buys me this pillow it says broadway bound judy and she's it, she's about to give it to me and my phone rings and it's my fucking agent he's like hi i'm like no <laughs> yeah they're putting i mean they they of course they still want to do it but who the fuck knows what's gonna happen and i was so excited i have the book coming out and then i was gonna go to broadway and it was like i had a year of not worrying you know what i mean so that really sucks but it sucks for you know knowing that all these other people are in the same boat and just this it's so horrible art is theater is so important so these shows which were like pre in pre-production will they still be able to get funded and who the fuck knows mm -hmm. like everything's gonna change and like what's first of all no one's gonna go to theater until there's a vaccine and then they're still gonna be paranoid and then there's going to be so many precautions backstage. We don't know what the new normal is. And what are people going to want to come see in the theater? Like really happy, like forget about the fucking world shit, you know? So I know you're, I know you're in P-Town right now. I know you've had a house there forever. How long, yeah. like, did you leave New York mid-March? Like, have you, how March long? 14th, March 14th. And have you been back to the city? Uh, I came for two weeks uh, in June, actually three weeks in June. I came for two weeks, came back here for a week, then came back again. Um, I took Ben to Tulane. He's playing basketball for Tulane. So I went, I brought him to New Orleans uh, and came back. But so I've been there for like a little over three weeks. Um, I was there right when the riots were and everything's boarded up. Is it still boarded up? A small, a, a, I would say like 25% is still boarded up, but mostly not. It was so... It was bad. I'm, the The 7 o'clock clapping was great, but it's... I, know, I remember walking to the improv in the mid-80s on 44th and 10th, and I remember, you know, I'd get off the subway, and it was pre, you know, Giuliani, disnifying, you know, and just, you know, hypodermic needles and XXXX, X, you know, porno movie, you know. But there was something gritty and great about it. You know, not great, but, you know, there was something. This, to me, was riding my bike. I ride my bike everywhere anyway, but it was like I was living in another country. No theater. No, there's no reason that, th you know, you live in New York City so that when you walk out of your apartment, you're in New York City. And it was like, there's no New York City. And what it's really sad. It's so sad. So to be fair, it is now that we're in a new phase, it is, you know, people are all out on the streets, outdoor right, dining. Right. It's a whole moment. There's a lot of energy. It feels very vibrant right now, actually. It feels very, very alive. Are you, so you'll be, you'll be in P-Town performing through the end of the summer? Right. Yeah. And then you'll come back. I'll come back. Yeah. I mean, I still have my apartment. I mean, like I'm a New Yorker. I love, I love New York. It's just that I, you know, I can't go out and do sets. So right. why well, live in my 950 square foot apartment with one bathroom by the elevator when I could, you know, <laughs> right. play tennis every day and go to the beach and do my work and yeah. Right. But I love, I love New York. But so many people are leaving. I know. You know, Lisa's 
you know, runs this real estate company and she, they have some buildings in New York and it's like, the tenants are just leaving. They can't pay the rent. It's, it's really sad. And what's going to happen? Like people are going to be like, oh, I don't need to pay for an office. I can have people work from home and Zoom and, you know, but nothing will replace live performance. It's all going to come back. I mean, I even saw, um, I even saw, actually, here, this is sort of an interesting question. I wonder if you have an opinion on this. I guess to start, are you, like, what is your awareness of, like, the housewives? Zero. Zero. Okay. <laughs> so here's, like, an example. So do you know who Countess Luann is? Yes, of course. I know her. Yeah, yeah. So your awareness is not zero. You do have. All right. It's, no, I know her. I know the ones from Atlanta. I know. Yeah. But I know Countess Luann, her her uh boyfriend slash agent was my first agent ever um but yeah i've worked with her yeah yeah yeah. you've worked with her yeah we did a um fashion show for prostate cancer thing uh where she was on it i was on it and then uh i was hosting it and then did I do her 54 Below show? She had a 54 Below show. Yeah, okay, and she so, would have, yeah. so this is what I want to talk to you about. So she, in in recent years, she created this cabaret show. Like she has like a few songs right. that she's put out over the years, whatever. This cabaret show, which initially the first show was at 54 Below, which was ironically the last venue that I saw you at back in right. January. You were doing coronavirus jokes and like, yeah. look what happened two months later. But um, like seriously, you were like the last one of the last live shows that I saw <laughs> at 54 Below, the same place that I saw Luann. And that show became so successful that she now was on a huge Live Nation tour. I'm were you aware of that, that she was on like this huge national tour? She was, she was on this huge tour making tons of money like she had like Murray Hill was like a resident like guest yeah. she had a couple comics, I guess. My question is, is now that I guess I'm I'm kind of giving you the framework, is that annoying to you? Oh my god. You know, it's annoying when when Stormy Daniels goes and does stand up. You know, it's you know, it's it's a bigger issue because there are people who will do something funny on the internet, right? And get like a million followers. And then a comedy club will be like, oh, I want that person because they're going to fill the room, right? And yet they don't have an act. They don't, they can't fulfill the hour, uh, the 45 minutes, whatever it is. And people are like, oh, that, that kind of sucked. But th- so that weekend or those dates are taken from a comedian who has been working and working on their material, who's uh, solid, who doesn't get a gig, but that's the way life is. And so it's like, you know, when people, uh, you know, I feel like in this, in, in this business, you have to constantly reinvent yourself. If she was, on, you know, good for her, she, she did it. And, and the fact that she used other people and paid other people, I think that's a good thing. You know, she's using her status and giving other people work. But when people who are not comedians who call themselves stand-up comics, you know, I did my first set in 1981, you know, don't think you can get on stage and just like tell a story and call it stand-up. That's not stand-up. It takes 10, 15 years to know what the fuck you're even doing on stage, you know? Mm -hmm. So I find that annoying when... But I don't know. I think hers is a little different. Did, is she talented? Is she a good singer? Um, I mean, right. she's okay. She's okay. I mean, Ben Rimmelauer produces and directs the show. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I it's mean, okay. And- it has its it has its charm, and the songs right. are good. You know, they're they're camp. Right. It's you know, it's camp. Right. So it's like, you know, I think that's a good business move, and the fact that she's you know giving the stage to other people, I love that. But but it's it's these people who. St- who else just recently decided they were going to do stand up? Some journalist. And I was just like, oh, okay, have fun. Telling a joke at your fucking dinner party is not doing stand You know what I mean? Right. It's just so, oh, it's so annoying. <laughs> Tell everyone where they can follow you, follow you online, your podcast, and the book, all the info about the book. 
Okay, so the book is called Yes, I Can Say That When They Come for the Comedian. When they come for com- the comedians, we're all in tra- I don't even remember it. I've said it so <laughs> uh, Anywhere you get books, you can pre order it now. It was coming, it's coming out July 28. It was coming out the same day as Mary Trump's book, but now hers is coming out early. Yay. Um, that was another black cloud that I was like, great. Um, so, and I did an audio book. It's a really oh, great book. I'm telling you. Uh, one of my, I just did someone's podcast in LA and they said it should be required reading. It really is about, you know, that we need to laugh. We need to stop taking ourselves so fucking seriously. And comedy is fucking important. Anyway, so yes, I can say that when the comfort of the comedians were all in trouble. Uh, and then um, I'm at Judy Gold, J E W D Y G O L D, on Twitter and Instagram. I do the face cock. I hate it. Um, I hate social media. I have like a love hate relationship with it. Because but your I podcast is killing it. And my po- yeah, kill me now. My podcast, which I fucking love. I'm interviewing Martha Plimpton today. Cool. And I've been doing it for five years, five a little over over five years. And it is definitely a labor of love. I love to. I love it's. And you know, we end up talking about what pisses people off the most. But I love learning about people and what makes them the, tick. The live podcast, the live tapings you do are amazing. Like I went to the Sandra Bernhard one, Alan Cumming, and Bridget Everett, and they were oh, all amazing. They were, I miss those so much. I know. Yeah, we did the live tapings, and it's so great because. You know, I don't care about what projects you're working on. I just want to know what the, like, what happened to you that made you a fucking performer and like what, you know, your childhood. And it's just fascinating. Like we talk about shit people usually don't talk about. Yeah. You know, I love it. Judy, you're, you're the greatest. Yes. You're fucking amazing. I love you. You made my day. I love you. Thank you. And your hair looks great. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Guys, you can follow me, JessXNYC. Follow the show account, Hot Takes Deep Dives. And we'll see you soon. Go listen to Judy. She's amazing. (laughs) 